Hello, everybody. Welcome to our program this afternoon. My name is Erica Lee, and I teach history and Asian American studies at the University of Minnesota. And I also direct the Immigration History Research Center, which is one of the organizers of our event today. I first want to begin with a land acknowledgement. I'm joining you and the University of Minnesota is on um, Dakota land. And today, many indigenous people, including Dakota and Ojibwe from throughout the state call the Twin Cities home. The Immigration History Research Center acknowledges that the migration and the immigration of international migrants and refugees to the United States has been part of the same US settler colonial practices that continue to displace and to dispossess indigenous peoples. We believe that the study of migration needs to acknowledge these intersections, these consequences and these legacies. And this land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we are trying to educate our campus and the larger IHRC community about the land that we inhabit and our ongoing relationships with it and each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and to advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. So this afternoon, this program is part of a long-standing partnership between the IHRC, between the Migration Scholar Collaborative, and between public books. The Migration Scholar Collaborative is a hub for scholars in the humanities and the humanistic social sciences that allows us to present our work to journalists, to lawmakers, and to thought leaders. The Migration Scholars Collaborative, or MISC for short, strives to decriminalize migration and open wider pathways to legal immigration in the United States. We've just put in the chat function a link to the MISC website. Uh, you can check it out for writings by MISC members and more. There's a newsletter, sometimes there's playlists, there's op-eds, there's lots of resources. Today's conversation features a number of scholars and writers who are part of MISC who have contributed to a special public book series on migration. This is the third program in that series. And before we get started, I just want to uh, note a few housekeeping items about the program this afternoon. First, the webinar is being recorded. And second, we are going to be using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window for questions um, as part of the program in the later um, section of our afternoon for audience uh, participation. You can submit a question at any time during the presentations. Um, we will turn to audience questions after our moderated discussion, and we will remind you to, uh, to put in your questions at that time as well. You can use the anonymous name function if you wish to do that as well. And so now it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today. A. Naomi Paik joins us again as our moderator. Uh, she is an associate professor of criminology, law and justice and global Asian studies at the University of Illinois in Chicago. She's also the author of the amazing book, Bands, Walls, Raids, Sanctuary, Understanding US Immigration for the 21st Century, which was published in 2020 and Rightlessness, Testimony and Redress in US Prison Camps Since World War II which was published in 2015. Welcome, Naomi. Thank you so much for helping us moderate this discussion today. Okay, thank you so much, Erica, for bringing us on board and introducing the whole program and NISC and Public Books and the IHRC and for the land acknowledgement. So um, just to give you a little bit more context about the Public Books series, um, Public Books is an open access online magazine where curious readers discover leading scholars and ex experts writing about today's most interesting books, films, media, and cultural trends. The Borderlands series, co-edited by Jerry Kadava, Kat Ramirez, and, my, and me, uh, focuses on urgent issues of migration, borders, borderland cultures, and envisioning futures where people have the freedom to stay and the freedom to move. 
And we're honored to have curated this series from crisis to futurity with the Migration Scholars Collaborative and to co-host today's events. The articles in this series take various forms, including the manifesto, the interview, and the historical essay. And yet each of them offer vital historical context urgent political critique, and an expansive understanding of all the aspects of life in the United States that immigration affects. And now it is my honor to introduce our first speakers. Carl Linskung is Associate Professor of History at Raritan Valley Community College and the author of the fantastic book, Detain and Punish, Haitian Refugees and the Rise of the World's Largest Immigration Detention System. He is currently writing a new history of the sanctuary movement from Reagan to Trump that I personally am very excited to read. So <laughs> um, joining uh, Carl will be Elliot Young, who is professor in the history department at Lewis and Clark College. Professor Young is the author of Alien Nation, Chinese Migration in the Americas from the Cooley era through World War II, Caterino Garza's revolution in the Texas-Mexico border, and co-editor of Continental Crossroads, Remapping U.S.-Mexico Borderlands History. He is also the author of a new book, Forever Prisoners, How the United States Made the World's Largest Immigrant Detention System. He is a co-founder of the Migration Scholars Collaborative and one of the reasons we all got together in the first place. Both Elliot and Carl have co-authored Abolish Migrant Prisons, a Manifesto. Thanks so much. Thanks, and I think I'm going to go first and talk for a few minutes, and then Carl is going to um, follow me. So this essay, the basic idea of this essay is to think broadly about why it is we have so many migrants incarcerated in the United States today. And what we did was try to look back to earlier moments in history the idea of the freedom to move is something that has existed for millennia, that idea. And certainly it is a liberal ideal um, that comes out of the French Revolution from the late 18th century and is articulated in various forms throughout the, the 19th century. So given that there is this liberal ideal that people should have the freedom to move, why is it that in the United States, um, we've become the world's leader by far in locking up immigrants simply for the act of, of migrating. And in this brief essay or manifesto, what we do is look back at that history. So it begins at least in the late 19th century in terms of federal um, immigrant incarceration and has ebbed and flowed over the course of the 20th century. But what we see is that it's not always inevitable that simply because people are coming into the country that those people need to be locked up in prison-like conditions. And we saw a brief interregnum or um, pause on that policy in 1954 all the way through the 1970s, at least for people coming into seaports although at the same time, we see lots of Mexicans um, being held, put in detention and deported uh, in that same time period. So let me just talk about how this idea uh, might fly in the face of what has now become common sense for certain people. I do a lot of expert witness testimony for asylum cases and in a recent case I had uh, the ICE attorney uh, on cross-examining me about all of my tweets and Instagram posts and things I've written asked me whether I'd written and how I defend the idea of abolishing ICE and asked me, do you really believe in ending immigrant detention? And I said, yes, I do. And had to give a very short historical explanation of how um, immigrant detention was not always the go-to response for people coming into the country. It, it, certainly, you know, there have been elements of this from the time of Chinese exclusion as they're trying to enforce these um, immigrant restrictionist laws, but, um, but 
it, it has not always been the case that we've needed to lock up what um, under Trump reach the level of half a million uh, immigrants per year. So the DHS or ICE attorney asked me, well, hypothetically, how would you respond when an immigrant is released from a court and then goes on to commit a murder or some other violent assault? Um, wouldn't it be better if that person were locked up? And it's precisely that kind of hypothetical that is supposed, that justifies and legitimizes not only the immigrant detention system, but prisons all over the place. And my response was that that is preemptive policing. We do not put people in prison imagining that in the future they might commit some kind of crime. It's possible that I, after this presentation, go out and commit a murder, but I hope that I won't be put in detention um, simply based on the possibility that I might um, commit some crime in the future. And so to live in a free society means that a certain number of people will go out and commit crimes or violent acts. And, um, and we must account for those acts once they've happened and not before they've happened. So I think what this essay asks us to do is to imagine a world where migrant prisons are no longer necessary. And that is a world where we don't have laws that criminalize the act of migration as we do now. And so rather than simply focusing on trying to make the system that we have better by making the conditions in immigrant detention centers more humane, or trying to carve out groups of people who will be released like unaccompanied minors or women. Um, I think it's important to think more broadly about why in the first place are any people put in situations of denying their liberty of incarceration for the act of migration, which is uh, should be guaranteed as one of the principal freedoms that we have in the modern era. So thank you, and I will pass it off to Carl. All right. Um, thanks so much for this opportunity. Thanks to Erica and the Immigration History Research Center and to uh, Migration Scholars Collaborative for hosting this, to Kat, Naomi, and Jerry uh, for editing. Um, and, um, and for Margie, Pat, and Carrie for working behind the scenes to make this happen. So, um, so at, as Elliot was saying, I think he did a good job introducing this. I'm really glad he went first. Um, um, uh, our manifesto adds to the voices calling for the abolition of migrant prisons, and it frames this demand as a piece of the larger campaign to abolish all prisons and to decriminalize movement. Um, when Elliot and I were began discussing this piece, we were considering the different forms it might take. And we were, of course, as historians, thinking about something that can contextualize and provide the longer history. But then when we considered manifesto, we thought maybe it could do certain things um, that a traditional scholarly essay couldn't. It's polemical and it can get right to an explicit demand that makes it more of a political tool than maybe a scholarly or academic piece could be. So that's, that's kind of how we imagine it. Um, in one section of the manifesto, uh, we acknowledge the outrage that Trump's family separation policy sparked, but then we observe that while some reforms made under Biden um, have occurred, the whole machine of border violence and um, exclusion, deportation, detention uh, rolls on at full speed under the current administration. And I was thinking about that and, and I came to the conclusion that in fact, um, this abolitionist manifesto is even more appropriate under the Biden administration than it would have been under the Trump administration. Because as we argue in the piece, um, we, we don't want to allow Trump's policies to appear aberrational. Um, we also, probably many people are aware, we just lost bell hooks, the great bell hooks. 
So I've been thinking more about her insistence that we identify the imperialist white supremacist capitalist patriarchy at the heart of this whole system. Um, and it seems that the call for abolition um, had it occurred under Trump might have left the impression that it was just his administration's policies which required this demand rather than a system that created Trump and created Biden and Obama and a hundred years of politics and politicians and policies. Um, the other thing I wanted to pull out from this discussion and the uh, manifesto is um, that I think looking at the long history of detention and placing in this form serves a few purposes. It's of course necessary to understand the long history of state violence that have produced things like migrant prisons in order to understand all that went into constructing an elaborate system of state violence, um, tying modern prisons um, to historical forms of state violence against indigenous people, against the enslaved, against those fighting against colonialism and imperialism, against racist policing. And doing this, I think Elliot would agree, we hope um, sort of sharpens the urgency of joining the abolitionist movement because we argue that while Anglo settlers might have seen violence deployed against indigenous people and in the dispossession of the land, uh, of, from their land, um, they might have seen this as necessary and um, inevitable. Many white Americans in the antebellum United States might have seen violence in defense of slavery as necessary and inevitable. Uh, supporters of American empire might have seen anti-insurgent violence against those in the Philippines or Vietnam as necessary and inevitable. Looking back, it seems when I'm talking to my students and having community conversations that many people might now recognize that that was not justified and was nowhere near inevitable. And um, so we are thinking maybe contextualizing and historicizing might also shine light on how uh, current expressions of state violence like imprisoning migrants are also not necessary nor inevitable at the time. Um, and so we conclude in the essay that, or the manifesto, that the only inevitability when violence occur is the inevitability of resistance. And when resistance is organized, it sometimes becomes movements, and movements sometimes become abolitionist movements. And all current abolitionist movements draw upon previous movements. Um, and so we hope our manifesto illuminates some of these connections and helps to build a future where the conversation can start shifting from what needs to be abolished and why, and what we might build in place of the migrant prisons and what places they once stood. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both so much for that. Um, I'm real. If you haven't had a chance to read um, their manifesto, I highly recommend it. Um, so you have the link um, available to you in the chat. Okay, so we're going to move on to our next speaker, um, who is Tori Hester. So Tori Hester is an associate professor in the Department of History at St. Louis University. Her book, Deportation, The Origins of a U.S. Policy, which was published by University of Pennsylvania Press in 2017, examines the national and international origins of US de deportation policy. It is also a fabulous book, you should read it. Okay, so for the public book series, Tori wrote, Can the Courts Decriminalize Immigration? So thank you so much, Tori. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, all right, so I have the same thank yous as Carl read. Thank you to public books, editors in the Borderlands series, Naomi, Jerry, and Kat, who uh, worked with me on my piece. Thank you. Thank you to Pat, Margie, Carrie at the IHRC, and also to Erica. And finally, thanks to my other panelists and you all in the audience. So let me dive right in. Um, in 2011, prosecutions for unlawful entry overtook federal drug prosecutions as the most commonly prosecuted federal crime. And that's a 1325 uh, violation. It's a misdemeanor. Add in prosecutions for re-entering after a deportation, a 1326 violation. Um, that's a felony that can carry a 20-year sentence, and for at least a decade, 
almost half of all federal prosec prosecutions have been for immigration related crimes. Now, so what I'm talking about is the criminalization of immigration, and it's much more than that. US policymakers beginning in the 1980s made federal prosecutions of immigrants under sections 1325 and 1326 into a pillar of the carceral state. And the significance of these prosecutions is more than just the numbers. Almost all prosecutions target Latinx immigrants with devastating economic and social consequences for communities across the country, including the breakup of mixed status families. Uh, they also fuel stereotypes about Latinx criminality that worsen the racism plaguing the nation. My piece for public book looks at the efforts to decriminalize immigration undertaken by federal defenders such as Kara Hartzler out of San Diego, along with immigration advocacy organizations such as Mahinte um, out of Arizona or grass and grassroots leadership in Texas, as well as the work of historians and legal scholars. My piece explains why this decriminalization effort is happening now in the particular way it's happening. With the rest of my time today, instead of going over my article, which you can read or perhaps you've read, I wanted to kind of give you an update. Federal defenders are making legal challenges in lower federal courts against 1326 charges. There are cases pending in Chicago in the Fourth Circuit from uh, a Virginia case. Lots of challenges are coming out of Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, Oregon. On one hand, these legal challenges are mitigation tools for federal defenders. They've found that making these kinds of arguments are helpful in getting pleas from the government. Sometimes a prosecutor will even drop charges. Some of these challenges then are just about pragmatically helping people and families facing brutal consequences baked into the carceral state and less net. But on the other hand, these challenges are part of a constitutional challenge to 1325 and 1326. Two cases to keep an eye on are in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, one case is Kara Hartzler's case. She just filed in the Ninth Circuit on behalf of Manuel Rodriguez Barrio just last week. She expects oral arguments in the fall. Second case to keep an eye on is uh, Correa Lopez. Um, in the lower court, a judge due in Nevada found 1326 unconstitutional. The day after she did so, the government filed an appeal in the Ninth Circuit. Until that appeal is decided, no one in Nevada can be prosecuted under 1326. Now these challenges rise up beyond serving as a mitigation tool. Um, they're likely headed to the Supreme Court. Now, challenging 1326 uh, hinges on two arguments. One, an equal protection claim, and two, an argument about disparate impact, that these laws overwhelmingly and out of proportion to demographics impact Lat Latinx immigrants and communities. Now, I'll end my comments on the work of the scholars, academics, doing the legal history at the heart of the equal protection claim. When I talked to Kara last week, I asked her uh, what, if anything, that she wanted me to lift up for you in the audience. And she said that historians, the people doing this history, helped spark this particular decriminalization effort. Kara and uh, other federal defenders had been fighting 1326 cases for years, and they had no idea about the history. A turning point, though, came when she read a piece, a popular history piece, that talked about the origins of 1325 and 1326. And when she and other federal defenders read this history, in work done by scholars like Kelly Lettle Hernandez and uh, S. Deborah Kang, they, they could see a way to make an equal protection claim that hadn't occurred to them. Now, without those works of history, this movement that has some traction and has worked as a mitigation tool would not be. Now, historians have not only helped spark this strategy, but scholars like Kelly Lytle Hernandez, S. Deborah Kang, May Nye, Eric Fish, Ingrid Eagley, Benjamin Gonzalez O'Brien, among others, are writing briefs, testifying in evidentiary hearings. They are doing the new rate research as new legal questions come up. All of this is time consuming and their testimony in courts is not easy to say the least, something that Elliot can speak to uh, 
in his from his experiences in asylum cases. Uh, but because of this scholarship, um, there this you know their work is critical to trying to decriminalize immigration and take down this pillar of the carceral state. So I'll I'll end there and I can uh, expand further in the Q and A. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Tori. Um, that those last couple of um, comments that you made that uh, as new people are creating new research as new legal questions emerge, I think um, gives kind of a pertinent salience to the work that we as historians do. So I really appreciate that intervention. Okay, so we'll just move on to our last speaker and then we'll open up space for all of us to be in conversation together. So our last speaker is uh, Catherine S. Ramirez. Um, she is the professor and chair of Latin American and Latino studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And she is a scholar of Latinx literature, visual culture and history, um, comparative ethnic studies, gender studies and speculative fiction. Her most recent monograph is Assimilation, an, alter an Alternative History, which garnered an honorable mention for the Modern Language Association 2020 Prize in United States Latina and Latino and Chicana and Chicano Literary and Cultural Studies. Kat is not only a co-editor of the Public Books Borderland series, and I'm so honored that uh, I get to work with you as a co-editor, but she also co-authored A Beacon of Futurity and a Balm of Security. So thank you so much, Kat. Thank you, uh, Naomi. Thank you, everyone, um, for, for being here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my um, contribution to our series, From Crisis to Futurity. Um, but I also want to talk about um, the inspirations uh, for my essay. Um, so uh, as Naomi just mentioned, you know, I, I am a co-editor of the Borderland series and um, I was in a position as co-editor to see the various contributions to our, our series. And um, my essay was inspired um, by those of my colleagues, uh, in particular, um, Tori's essay, about activist lawyers like Kara Hartzler, whom she mentioned just a moment ago. Um, these lawyers who are working to decriminalize migration. And I was also inspired by uh, Carl and, and Elliot's manifesto, um, which uh, stresses the right to remove or, or to remain home and to live in dignity free from state violence. Um, I also saw um, a need for um, an essay, a contribution to this conversation about art and um, art as a form of activism. And so um, I decided that I would write about um, Guadalupe Maravilla, who um, is uh, a phenomenal multimedia artist based in New York City, um, Maravilla was born in San Salvador in uh, 1976. Um, Maravilla migrated to the United States um, as what is today known as an unaccompanied child migrant um, when he was only eight years old. Uh, and he um, grapples with this experience in, in many of his, um, his works, which include um, multimedia installations, um, performances, um, sculptures, and music. And so the um, piece that I focus on in my essay, A Beacon of Futurity and a Balm of Security, is about um, a performance that I was introduced to when I was part of a show called Mundos Altornos um, at the Queens Museum in New York City in 2019. And so in addition to writing about um, assimilation and women zoot suitors, I'm a scholar of um, speculative fiction or science fiction. Um, and I am very interested in ways um, 
people um, who are generally not associated with the future imagine the future. And I think there is quite a bit of overlap between my essay and the others in the series, um, in particular, uh, Tori's and Carl and Elliot's essays, um, because I think everyone about whom we're writing and even the, the form of the manifesto, the form the, as, as, a, as a literary form, you know, the manifesto is very future oriented. It, it points us um, in a direction that the authors believe that we need to be moving in. Um, and so I, I decided to write about um, Maravilla and Maravilla's own visions of um, a healthier, less toxic, uh, more just future. And um, Maravilla is also um, a survivor of colon cancer, um, which resonated very much for me because um, during uh, the pandemic in July of 2020, my, my own mother was diagnosed with colon cancer. And so my sisters and I began a rotation of moving in with our parents and, and caring for them. Um, which we continue to, to this day. Um, and so uh, I, I was fortunate enough to attend um, a sound bath that Maravilla um, gave with his collaborator, Sam Zhu, a year ago today, the first day of spring um, in 2021. And this sound bath took place in a gallery in New York City. Um, I attended remotely. So I, I lay on my bed and I listened to headphones and just had these like waves of sound wash over me. Um, and it was a very, um, it was a powerful experience. And I don't consider myself you know, like a spiritual person or I, I live in Santa Cruz, but um, I like to think that I am um, pretty practical and, and cynical. Um, and uh, yeah, this was actually a very moving experience for me. And so I am now, um, uh, I'm writing about Maravilla and this new project um, that I've been working on for a little while now on, it's a history of, of child migrants. Um, and so I'm very interested in like, like, well, how long have there been, I mean, this category that the government uses unaccompanied alien child, like what is the history of this term? Um, uh, like how long have children migrated uh, without a, a parent or guardian? Um, Maravilla's own story is very compelling when he entered the United States as an eight-year-old uh, with the assistance of a coyote, he had to hide underneath a dog and so like the the figure of, of the the canine you know the, the coyote or the dog figures prominently in uh, many of his works and, and we see an allusion to it in uh, walk on water the performance that i focused on in my essay um i also am very interested in what's known as the temporal turn in migration studies so this focus on on time and i feel that um i write about this in the opening of my essay the, the pandemic um, gave those of us who have the power and privilege of, of US citizenship, um, it gave us a kind of glimpse of um, the conditions in which many undocumented people live in the 21st century, enforced presentism, enforced presentism. so this, this focus on the present and inability to plan, um, uncertainty about the future, precarity um and yeah i just yeah i this writing this piece inspired new questions like what kinds of subjects does time or does waiting produce and um who is denied um the right to um envision the future uh and so these are the questions that i will leave you all with um but yeah these are the questions i continue to to ponder as i develop a new project um, in which Guadalupe Maravilla's um, oeuvre figures prominently. So thank you for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Kat.
Um, and uh, I really, I love the uh, temporal turn that Kat is encouraging us to move towards. Um, and I think there's a lot in your in your closing comments that kind of remind me of Sharam Khosravi's work on waiting and about deportation and the whole point of um, much of the experience of migrant regulation and ma management um, from the from the language of the state is really about um, holding back and holding captive migrant time, right? That enforced presentism, the fact that um, deportation and detention actually steal time away, that there's always a temporal dimension to the experience of being undocumented, to the experience of constantly being either on the move or being uh, suspended in time in some way. So I think that um, you, your, your comments have me going in so many different directions. So um, again, I wanna encourage anyone in the audience to feel free to um, post questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, we would love to hear from you and love to hear uh, any comments or questions that you have for our speakers. Um, just to kind of get, get things moving, I'll, I'll um, pose a couple of questions to all of our, to all of our speakers. Um, I noticed when I was rereading the pieces this morning that um, they really put together, remind me of er Avery Gordon's provocation that we need to know where we live in order to imagine living elsewhere, and we need to imagine living elsewhere before we can live there, right? And I think that all of these three essays together um, highlight the range of forms and types of intervention that our series together um, is trying to highlight and to offer different kinds of entry points and horizons for thinking about migration in the borderlands. So Tori offers us a very detailed history of the racist, uh, racist origins that criminalize migrants who cross the border and is linking it to the federal courts opening the door to potentially overturning these laws. So I'm really um, fascinated um, to see where this all goes. <laughs> Um, Carl and Elliot give us a manifesto that alongside Tori's essay historicizes the criminalization and caging of migrants of all kinds, um, which as, the, as everyone emphasizes in the whole series, none of this was about Trump or 45, um, but it kind of hit the national consciousness in a different kind of way. It got traction in a different kind of way. Um, and they, uh, Carl and Elliot demand that we abolish not only migrant prisons, but structures of punitive state violence altogether, which targets many different people. So how can we pull at all of these different threads simultaneously? And their manifesto is a demand on, uh, on the present right now, on all of us right now, um, to build a different kind of emancipated future um, and amplifying the inevitability of resistance that such oppressive forces engender. And then finally, Kat's essay, um, uh, Reading Guadalupe Maravilla's performance art, um, draws on migrant presence as well as their speculative futures, right? And explicitly calls on us to look at the arts and the importance of imagination, not as some frivolous thing that is an addendum to history, but as part of creating the world that we actually want to live in, right? Um, one in which migrant prisons no longer exist, one in which uh, the US is not the leader in, oops, sorry, I had set an alarm. Um, um, one in which the US is no longer the world's leader in incarceration and bringing that world into existence. So, um, I have a couple of questions. So um, I gave you a couple of questions to begin with, but um, I actually have a different one. <laughs> and I think that Kat's comments kind of got me on this line of thinking, but it really is about this um, temporality, right? So all, of, all three of your essays are really thinking about what's happening right now, but all in anticipation of a future and wanting to build a different kind of future. And then listening to Elliot's comments about um, your, uh, uh, back and forth with the federal, the ICE prosecutor, right? Kind of reminds me, I mean, she basically asked you, well, what about the rapists? Or what about the murderers? This is why we have to um, hold migrants in detention because they might do something bad, right? Which is kind of the logic undergirding a lot of our carceral systems. So um, that itself is a, has a temporal dimension. Um, the logic of preemption and the logic of inevitability that it is like that migrant detention is just the way we have to do things is also very future oriented, but in a very dystopian um, kind of state based way. And so I'm wondering, um, I'm going to, I know that you wanted me to open this to everyone or like to specific people, but I kind of want to keep this as an open question. And I want to think about um, how do we keep these um, two different kinds of 
visions of the future um, in our minds together? And how do we kind of preempt <laughs> the state's preemptive logic that um, feeds into the carceral state? And how do we kind of, um, you know, rob energy from that vision of, that they are creating and putting a lot of resources and investments into creating? And how do we siphon that off and put it more into the manifesto that you put together into the um, speculative uh, future futuristic vision that uh, Guadalupe Maravilla is putting together? How might it inform some of those legal strategies? It was really kind of surprising to me to hear that these lawyers did not know the racist origins. But now that they do, it is they are envisioning a new future and how can we use the law to build that future? So I just want to open it up there. If that seems like a very abstract question, I have more concrete ones too. So, um, but I, I kind of want to open it to all of you. Elliot, maybe I'll ask you to start since you were the one who had this back and forth with that ICE lawyer. Yeah, it's <laughs> it kind of could have been a, a performance art piece um, because if you're being asked by the person sort of representing the government uh, to try to defend these ideas that we all talk about in our classes, in our writings, but here you are in an actual case and there they have in, in essence weaponized my tweets and my public speech, which is protected by the constitution to try to discredit me for a case that was about Guatemala. So the, you know, it's completely irrelevant, but basically a political attack. And I, th I thought it was, um, it was useful though, because a lot of the assumptions, he just assumed, oh, it was kind of a got you question. Like these people are gonna go out and do these things. And it's just like, we have to start from the presumption, I think that we live in a free society where people are not criminalized um, for things that they haven't done. And we could, you know, that's before even getting to the question of whether they should be criminalized for the things that they have done because laws have been created to criminalize migration um, as Tori talks about. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of these different strategies, uh, and I wanna speak specifically to the legal strategies that Tori was talking about in 1326, um, the, the sort of legal arguments against it, even though that could be seen as, they're not arguing to abolish immigrant detention at all. They're taking a big chunk of the people who are put in detention on this one charge and trying to get rid of it. But the argument underlying it is that the law was based in racial animus. All of those of us who do the history of immigration policy know that the whole damn thing is based in racial animus. So if they actually succeed in that, one could imagine continuing the historical argument and saying, showing how immigration restrictions have always been based and continue to be based in racial animus and therefore um, one could argue are unconstitutional. Tori, I wonder if you have um, like a follow up. I'm, I'm just wondering because um, the whole damn system is racist. And also that kind of give, raises concern for me that someone's gonna wake up to that on the prosecutorial side <laughs> or on the legislative side and be like, well, then we can't admit that uh, 1326 is also racist because then that might unspool the whole thing. Right. So um, these are just some of the questions that come to my mind and just thinking about um, the history of the federal courts when it comes to immigration and how um, they have basically abdicated any role in um, checking Congress's power. And then I'm also thinking about the Muslim ban being fully ratified as totally not racist. You know, so these are some of the questions that come to my mind. So I don't know if you have any uh, follow up thoughts. You know, I've got lots, but I, I, one of the things that sparked and, and I hadn't, I haven't thought through this, um, but I'll just raise it is uh, last week I read something about the Ukraine by Princeton's historian Stephen Kotkin, and he said something about the power of Putin and Russian oligarchs and he said, 
If money just gushes out of the ground in the form of hydrocarbons and diamonds and other minerals, the oppressors can emancipate themselves from the oppressed. So I think that has some resonance um, for our conversation and the profit motive behind uh, immigrant detention and, and immigrant prisons. And so before we had this carceral turn, there's always been an exploitation of immigration status. Um, but employers, big ag, they were dependent on workers. And in that relationship, there, there was power for the workers. And, and since this crimigation turn, Prison, the prison industry has gutted that powers and it is the bodies of people, the human caging that makes people money. And so I think this speaks to need to get at something, well, Naomi's first book on rightlessness, which is a book that I turn again and again. And it's like thinking about how you can empower people who are rightlessness. So I'll end there. I wonder though, Tori, um, just thinking about sort of the way in which uh, immigrant detention is a for-profit industry, corporations are making money off of it, your localities are making money off of it, but whether that really explains at the immigrant detention system or the general carceral system, which is largely in the hands of the state, or whether there are other motives at work and Kelly Lytle Hernandez's work talks about it as sort of the need to eliminate whole populations and and which is not, you know, in some sense, like the neoliberal corporate fantasy is open borders that people come in, they're able to exploit them. Um, and so this kind of flies, I mean, the Trump protectionist rhetoric is in that sense, not classically neoliberal. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna hold on that so that Kat and, and Carl can have some time to chat. And if there's more time, I'll jump back in on that really important point. Um, Carl, did you want to say something? Sure. I, yeah, I have some uh, or... connection issues there. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd like to respond. Um, so I think Kat's framing of the sort of redirecting our attention to temporal boundaries and then Naomi's articulation of um, a set of questions there where there's a lot there. Um, but I, I was thinking about, um, you know, manifest destiny as another thing that's both spatial and temporal, you know, it's built, built on a future assumption of domination and control. And, but it informed an approach to land and space. And it assumed that, you know, it would require that a sort of legitimate violence to dispossess people from the land so that the, you know, the, the legitimate people could occupy it, uh, Anglo settlers or whoever they were. Um, and when you're trying to sort of link settler colonialism with some of the things we're talking about, like migration detention, um, it seems like there's some of those same temporal boundaries, struggling around temporal boundaries there. Um, and I'm just thinking about um, some people who've worked on that, uh, that sort of intersection, like Nick Estes' book, Our History is the Future, and thinking about um, how indigenous conceptions of history can also be a form of uh, resistance um, to settler colonialism, but also the way it uh, expresses itself as the carceral state. Um, so those are some of the things that came to mind um, when we start thinking about temporal boundaries and uh, especially in response to Naomi's question. So I really appreciate you um, bringing up uh, Estes, um, Carl. Yeah, there are a lot of um, a lot of really rich ways to think about time and, and the future in particular. Um, I want to talk though for a moment just about, I'll talk about um, DACA. Um, so, uh, you know, there's this deferred, you know, this notion of deferral, you know, which means, you know, both to um, 
to postpone, to delay, to wait, but also to submit. If you know, we think about the the meanings of this word to defer, you know, to submit to some authority, and um, the you know we see this term defer in, in deferred action for childhood arrivals. Um, DACA recipients are, are not um, incarcerated in the same ways as um, uh, migrants in detention. Um, differences notwithstanding, however, uh, both detained migrants and DACA recipients are unfree. Uh, both are held captive by a migration apparatus organized around carcerality and precarity. And this is the other really important term. So going back to what we're talking about, about um, capitalism and the need for labor, um, you know, if we're really going to talk about labor and you know the future of labor, we need to talk about automation as well. And, and by and large, there, there, there's data that shows that people don't get as freaked out about automated automation and automated labor as they do about immigrants and immigrant workers. You know, immigrants is like the economic migrant in particular as an interloper and opportunist, you know, who's going to come in and um, steal natives jobs. Um, the documented, however, are, so, you know, you have to be a certain age to, to have DACA. You have to have certain um, uh, qualifications. It was, you know, it's a kind of based on the DREAM Act, which also requires like you're either a skilled worker, a future skilled worker, or a soldier. Um, and, um, you know, the, the documented you know, because they are deportable, you know, they are very fit as precariat workers. And so I think it's really important to keep um, precarity in, in, the, in the picture, make it, you know, put it in conversation with carcerality. Um, because I think this is a, these are just two huge uh, forces that shape migration um, uh, in this country in particular, um, but, Precarity, I think, also plays a very important role in other countries of the global war. I really appreciate all of your comments. And I think um, DACA, I, I love that turn towards DACA and the deferment, the, the deferral, not only as it's uh, as a temporal dimension, but also as a submission, right? In order to get this uh, this kind of status, you have to be a good immigrant, which means you cannot have a criminal record, right? You have to be in school or in the military or have a job, et cetera. And um, I think we have other kinds of statuses like this, like TPS, which has just been granted to Ukrainians, right? It's temporary. The whole point is that it's temporary, even if you've had TPS for 15 years, right? And so like you're, you're never able to really have a settlement here until there's like an, a legislative um, kind of uh, uh, pathway. Um, is carved out for you, but until then, you every eighteen months you have to your your future might be taken away from you, and so. Or, um, or, or, well, just to add to that really quickly, I mean, like the Dream Act turned twenty last year. I mean, it was introduced twenty years ago, and this is legislation that limited like you have you can't be over the age of thirty five. Well, a lot of people who would have qualified for the Dream Act. Mm -hmm. are no longer eligible if, if it even were realized mm -hmm. and so this is like legislation that hinges on like the promise the value of youth mm -hmm. um but we have this um permanent temporariness mm -hmm. yeah and i think this also talks to this other kind of uh thread that i see kind of pulling through all three of your essays and it's about um, you know, what is that vision for the future, right? Um, on the one hand, it's the enforced presentism that Kat has been talking about that many people, including many migrants, are forced to be in. It is, it, the whole point of enforced presentism is to deprive or strip people of a future, of being able to imagine a future, at least in this country. You cannot really put roots down here because you know, TPS might be taken away or whatever, right? But um, I think one of the things that that raises is that, oh, the child or the, you know, the youth um, as being a more sympathetic character, whereas their parents or aunties or grandparents are not, but they age out of that kind of status, right? And so I think this uh, brings up again, um, how important it is that when we create, uh, when we're envisioning this future, that we not leave anyone behind. 
And so I think that uh, the abolitionist manifesto, I think what uh, Maravilla is doing, and then maybe what some of, maybe <laughs> if these lawyers can unspool the racism at the heart of 1325 and 1326, maybe they can unspool the whole thing. But I want, I want to think about, um, uh, or have you think about rather, <laughs> um, just thinking about what are some of the strategies that need to work alongside and with the one that Tori is talking about with these kind of activist lawyers who are now very historically informed and trying to unspool the whole thing. What are some of the other strategies that we need to pile on in order to build that other future? So Kat, you've talked about the importance of art and also about embodiment, I think, um, is really important to this too. And also um, you're bringing up uh, your, your, your mom getting sick at, at around the same time you saw this piece about the labor of care. And I'm wondering if there's other kinds of strategies, tactics, anything that you want to contribute to this conversation about how do we get from this enforced presentism to that other kind of future? I'll, I'll just say something that about local versus federal. So as we all know, federal immigration enforcement is a federal function. A lot could be done at the local level to try to create stable communities for, um, for migrants undocumented migrants. And this, of course, was under the headline of sanctuary. That's one way to get local law enforcement out of the job of doing what the federal immigration does. So I think, you know, whereas the federal level, it seems very hard to make any change because of Congress and who those people are at the local level, um, sometimes we could have more of an effect, especially if we're living in supposedly progressive uh, districts and we have more access to put pressure. So I would say we should focus our, our actions locally. I'll jump in right after that and say that then another thing that's um, most accessible or doable at the local level is incorporating strategies of resistance that involve things like direct action, you know, and um, and then we can see the effectiveness of that when it's tied to sort of national and even local and state political action or legislative action. So um, we, you know, in the modern area of immigration detention, there were these sort of simultaneous and overlapping campaigns to challenge these detention laws in the courtroom, but also there were protests and things really happening at the grassroots. And um, and that's been true, right? Like when the, after they passed the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which was a federal initiative to strengthen the capture and return of runaway slaves, Northern communities passed these personal liberty laws. And when that wasn't effective, you know, they just physically stopped the federal agents from capturing and returning uh, fugitive slaves or like broke into jails and just freed them, you know? And it's all that. And it's a larger abolitionist movement, which was working politically you know, at all different levels, they were bringing court cases, but there was also always the threat and sometimes the realization of violent revolution. So I think it's, you know, it's all of this. Tori or Kat, do you have anything that you'd like to add towards the end? Okay, thank you all so much. I'm gonna uh, pass it over to Erica to close this out. Thank you so much, everybody. The conversation was going so well. I didn't want to pop in, um, but I do want to say I have found and have great appreciation for this conversation, um, helping to imagine alternative futurities. Because I think that I think that for so many of us, the past um, not just two years, not just what what was it six years, but many years have been. It feels like it's been going from hopping from crisis to crisis to crisis. And I'll just speak for myself um, in that there, <laughs> I may have had, I now realize that I had um, naive and false hopes. Well, naive hopes, I'll just say naive. I don't think they were false, but naive hopes that, um, that with, you know, new approaches with new scholarship, with new, um, with new activism that there, we'd see more change, you know, and I think we have, I do think we have, I just keep thinking back to the spontaneous grassroots 
um, protests that happened in January 2017 when the Muslim ban was was signed. Um, but I do, you know, we've all talked about it's been a year since Biden, what's changed, what hasn't. It's very clear that whatever the racial reckoning that happened in 2020 is has quickly dissipated. And so I, I have felt more hopeless than hopeful. Um, but Elliot's uh, reminder that local plus national um, work needs to happen is a good reminder. Carl's focus on, I mean, I'm a historian, so I should remember this, but the long struggle, <laughs> the long struggle, keeping your eye on the long struggle is always important. Um, and um, Tori's um, amplifying the work that our fellow colleagues are doing. I mean, I gotta say, right? Previous generations of historians, they weren't doing this. Um, they were doing, you know, similar kind of engaged work for, to be sure. But I, I do feel like there's a, a great um, broadening of the work that more historians um, and humanities uh, scholars are doing in like, you know, uh, um, in many different aspects of our society. And that's inspirational as well. Um, and then, of course, Kat's reminder that we we can always find inspiration from art um, and that we can always think about the, um, the future with hope, um, even when times may feel a little bit dark. So I just wanna say thank you to all of you for the conversation, for Naomi, for the amazing questions and keeping the conversation going and for everyone who's joined us today. Um, at the IHRC, we have one more event this spring, and it is on immigrant legal status among essential frontline workers in the U.S. during the pandemic. It's happening April 14th um, from 4 o'clock to 5 p.m. Central Time. But thank you, everyone, for joining us. Stay well, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Erica. Thanks, Naomi. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Thanks, everybody.